Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining tonight's exciting event, Ending the Prohibition of the Mind, a Mushroom Symposium. We are so excited to dive into this fascinating and completely on trend issue tonight. You know, in January, the New York Times named mushrooms the ingredient of the year in 2022. And though I know they were making a culinary pronouncement, I think mushrooms are having the time of their lives in our culture in other ways as well. Collar City Mushrooms are a local culinary and medicinal mushroom farm and a key sponsor of tonight's event opened its doors in Troy in March 2021. The farm now produces hundreds of pounds of delicious mushrooms that supply local restaurants and households like mine across the capital region. If you're a Star Trek fan, the Mycelial Network plays a prominent role with one of the lead scientists named Dr. Stamets, a nod to magic mushroom pioneer Paul Stamets. And back in October, right here in Troy at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, the artist, the artist Mei Ling Loco, worked with a group to construct an art installation of mycelial tiles in our space. And of course, tonight's focus on magic mushrooms. I should also tell you that we're being joined tonight by folks who've gathered in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York for a bicycle day watch party. Let's hear it for Brooklyn and my new town, Troy, at Collar City Mushrooms at their own watch party. Go Troy! Um, we'll definitely turn our camera and mic over to folks in both of these locations later on in the program. And we do have a fantastic program for you all this evening with speakers that will address a wide range of issues about psilocybin, the naturally occurring compound found in magic mushrooms and the movement to legalize the substance. We're gonna hear from psychotherapist, educator, and activist, Dee Dee Goldpaw, two lawmakers who are championing this issue in Albany by sponsoring a number of bills that would decriminalize magic mushrooms, New York State Assembly members, Linda Rosenthal and Pat Burke. We'll also hear from Hadass Alterman, the founding partner of the Plant Medicine Law Group, Pam, Pamela Jackson, founder and director of the Psychedelic Sisterhood, and Noah Potter, a consultant with legal market strategies and a longtime advocate, thinker, and blogger about psychedelics. Noah's going to help us wrap things up before we open the program for questions and discussion. And I am totally bummed that my friend and activist, musician, poet, writer, and psychedelic practitioner, Dimitri Mugianis, won't be able to join us tonight. Just as we were experiencing this very strange nor'easter today in our region, Dimitri is in Jamaica experiencing storms and connectivity issues of his own. But it is okay because we have plenty to talk about and this gives us more time for open discussion. So before we turn it over to our first speaker, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host, Eileen Javier, um, who is going to talk a little bit about the sanctuary and the place uh, that we are all gathered this evening. Eileen? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Eileen, and along with Corinne Carey, I'll be moderating tonight's event. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Mohican people. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that the Sanctuary for Independent Media resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous people of the lands of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, and as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Tonight's event is sponsored by the People Health Sanctuary, one of the initiatives of the Sanctuary for Independent Media. The People Health Sanctuary is a central space in our campus in North Central Troy. It's dedicated to share health skills, provide basic integrative care, and explore ways to build networks of community health. And talking about building networks, this event is sponsored by a lot of other organizations, including Plant Medicine Law Group, Psychedelic Society of Western New York, Legal Matters 
Mar I'm sorry, legal market strategies, the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society, Bocal, New York, the Hudson Valley Psychedelic Society, the Capital Region Harm Reduction Roundtable, the Lens, the Psychedelic Sisterhood, the Heroic Hearts Project, the Center for Optimal Living, and the Qatar Center for Health Equity and Justice, and all of you in the house. <laughs> For those of you not yet familiar with the sanctuary, we are a nonprofit community organization based, as I said, in North Central Troy. Come visit. Just across the Hudson River from Albany, we operate a block wide campus of activities. And in this, um, in the midst of the pandemic, we will, we will, we will be sitting in the sanctuary for independent media. Unfortunately, this stopped us, but we're here today virtually with you. Uh, and as I said, our headquarters doubles as telecommunications facility and performance venue where we host speakers, independent film screenings and live music. It's also home to two recording studios for our community radio station, WOOC 105.3 FM. We host a volunteer driven nightly news and public affairs show called the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, where Corinne and I are both radio producers. Here at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, we also run a variety of youth programs, operate the Color City Growers, our urban gardens and bring all of our activities out into Freedom Square, which is an outdoor performance venue. We are thrilled to open the doors this past spring for our newest building on the block, which is the Nature Lab Urban Environmental Education Center, which houses a community science lab and the People's Health Sanctuary, which brought you this event is an extension of um, the People Health Sanctuary is an extension of our Nature Lab program. And as I said, it's focused on health empowerment and equity. We do a lot and we document everything. You can see it all if you visit Sanctuary TV, our YouTube channel, which has more than 50,000 subscribers. And we're counting on you to subscribe today. We are um, live streaming this event on our Facebook and we will be uploading an edited version of that video to the Sanctuary TV. And I would like to all of you, please, in the chat room, can you write, where are you? Where are you located? Where are you seeing us today? Are you having a watch party? I would like to see all of us right where you are. And shout out to the place uh, where you are tonight. And I'm going to turn it back to Corinne to go over some housekeeping and introduce tonight's panelists. Great. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I just want to let everyone know that this event is being recorded. So if you have your camera enabled, you could be visible on the recording. So if you don't want to be visible on the recording, you can turn your camera off. And if you do, turn it on. Um, similarly, we're going to be making the resources and discussion shared in this chat box available in the future. So um, you are free to use the chat box throughout this event. We at the Sanctuary I love the chat function. It allows all of us to communicate during the event. You can send messages directly to someone privately, or you could email the whole group um, questions or thoughts or observations. Um, so all you need to do is look at the bottom of your screen, or maybe it's the side of your screen, depending on what kind of a screen you're on, and you'll see a chat box and a Q&A box. If you have a question, uh, please type it into one of those boxes, and we'll call on as many of you as we can to unmute you uh, during our community discussion portion of tonight's event. And you can also send, uh, like I said, you can send a private message to someone through the chat function as well. This event is going to run until approximately 9 p.m. Um, so let's get ourselves started. And I am, I'm going to toss it back over to Eileen to introduce our first speaker. Unmute yourself, Eileen. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> am I unmuted now? Okay. Didi Gopat is a psychotherapist, educator, and activist in Woodstock, New York. Didi specializes in psychedelic integration therapy with a focus on 
LGBTQI plus people, as well as survivors of sexual trauma. Crosses and peppers and fries. They are a um, and they are a member of the ketamine assisted psychotherapy team at the Woodstock Therapy Center, and they are the community integration and support director of the Hudson Valley Psychedelic Society. Didi has taught and published widely on psychedelics and mental health, sexually and trauma. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Didi. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here tonight, um, just in the presence of so many people who have dedicated so much time and momentum to this movement. So as you heard, I'm a psychotherapist in private practice, and I have about a decade of experience um, doing psychedelic integration work and also psychedelic assisted therapy. So I have many years of background working in the clinical side of psychedelics, and I'm also the community support and integration director at the Hudson Valley Psychedelic Society. And we are a community based organization that provides free and low cost education and community support in the Hudson Valley. But maybe the most important thing I can tell you or share about myself tonight is that I was a person with treatment resistant post traumatic stress disorder. And for me, traditional psychotherapy did not work well to heal my symptoms, but psychedelics saved my life. But to gain at legal access to these medicines, I had to leave the country to work with indigenous healers. And while I have the utmost respect for the healers that gave me back a chance at a life worth living, nobody who is already traumatized should have to leave the country and literally climb a mountain to receive the healing that they need. So tonight, I'm going to give you some facts that sound incredible, and they are. So after my talk, I will drop a works cited list into the chat with every peer reviewed or scientific article that I'll be referencing in my introduction this evening. And I'd also like to point out that you may hear differing opinions tonight about how to best approach access to psilocybin in the safest and most socially just way. But despite our differences, everyone on this panel believes that people need and deserve access to this healing medicine, so we share a powerful common goal. So I've been given the formidable task of introducing our topic, the research and history of psilocybin mushrooms all in 10 minutes or less. So psilocybin mushrooms, as you probably know, are a type of mushroom that contains a psychoactive compound, psilocybin, that when ingested creates a shift in our visual, cognitive, or emotional perceptions. And humans have been taking them for a very long time. The archeological record suggests that the sacramental use of psilocybin mushrooms goes back at least 7,000 years. Evidence of the magic mushroom was found around the world in Europe, in North Africa, and of course, Mesoamerica. The mushroom was considered so sacred to the Aztecs, they called it the flesh of the gods. But the modern history of psilocybin mushrooms really begins in 1955, when Gordon Wasson, who is an amateur mycologist, made contact with a Oaxacan medicine woman named Maria Sabina, who allowed Wasson to take part in a healing ritual with psilocybin mushrooms. Wasson published a story in Life magazine in 1957 detailing his discovery of the magic mushroom and introduced it to the US public. So before we go on, I want to acknowledge that everything we're about to talk about, everything we're going to talk about here today, all of us sitting here are here because of the work of an indigenous woman healer. So most of us know what happens next, which is namely the 1960s, and we probably all know about the popularity of psychedelics and their connection to the anti-war and free love movements. But what you might not know is that clinical researchers were also exploring if psilocybin could be used to treat mood disorders, alcoholism, or enhance spiritual meaning throughout the 1960s. But in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act, a piece of legislation that was both actively racist and unscientific, made psilocybin illegal. It's not until the 1990s when researchers slowly begin to gain access to studying psychedelic medicines again. And since then, we've hit a crest that some call the psychedelic renaissance, where these substances with psilocybin leading the charge are being considered life-saving medicines. A recent literature review of the safety of currently illegal substances found that of the 20 substances ranked, psilocybin was the least lethal and had the lowest potential for dependency. It is nearly impossible to overdose on, and it's anti-addictive in its effects. 
To date, psilocybin is one of the most studied psychedelic substances. In fact, according to a recent article, psilocybin has now been given to more clinical research subjects than some FDA approved psychiatric medications. And despite all of this evidence, history and potential, psilocybin mushrooms are still considered by the federal government to be drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. So what does the research show? It shows that psilocybin can help ease existential anxiety at the end of life, to help people quit and maintain abstinence from alcohol and tobacco. It's highly effective at improving the lives of people with treatment resistant depression, and it performs better than common psychiatric medications like Lexapro with more enduring impact and fewer side effects. And that's only the research on folks with psychiatric diagnosis. The recent research that I have found most impressive is that psilocybin taken in naturalistic settings, meaning not with the oversight of a therapist or a doctor, but in nature or at home with friends or in community is highly effective at increasing well-being. One recent study found that psilocybin taken in a naturalistic setting decreased shame and trauma symptoms in adults who were abused as children and diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Psilocybin also improves symptoms of racial trauma in BIPOC populations. And yet another recent study showed that psilocybin taken in a naturalistic setting increased positive mood through the experience of personal transformation and feelings of connectedness to others. Moreover, this country continues to be in the midst of a crisis of opioid related deaths. In fact, there has been a 292% increase in opioid related deaths since 2001. Scientists have been exploring whether psychedelics can be helpful in treating various substance use disorders. A recent study exploring whether psychedelics taken in naturalistic settings could reduce opioid use found that a lifetime use of psilocybin was con conclusively linked to lowered risk for opioid use disorder or dependence. It's important to note that all psychedelic substances, just like any other medications, carry risks, especially for people with underlying mental health concerns. And that is why it's vitally important that we continue to support harm reduction and community-based organizations like psychedelic societies to improve public education and care for the community. So to review, psilocybin has been used for a very long time, and we know it has great potential to treat mental health issues at a moment when we are in a crisis of depression, anxiety, and addiction in this country. And we also know not only is psilocybin safe when taken responsibly, but peer-reviewed clinical research upholds its benefits when taken outside of a clinical context. Some of the questions surrounding psilocybin are, should it be decriminalized, meaning removing any legal punishment for its use or possession? Should it be restricted only to medical settings or should it remain illegal? My personal opinion has been formed as a community activist listening to the people in my community in the Hudson Valley and their needs. And as a psychotherapist with years of experience and training in both psychedelic integration therapy and psychedelic assisted therapies, specializing in working with extremely vulnerable populations, specifically the LGBTQ population and trauma survivors. As a therapist, I believe that certain people with certain psychiatric diagnosis may be safest taking psychedelics in a medical context with very specific protocols and clinical insight. Thus, we need to ensure that psilocybin and its place in the healthcare system, which is inevitable at this point, is financially accessible. We need to research sustainable models of group care. And finally, train and advocate for more therapists who are queer, transgender, and people of color to provide culturally competent care. Pharmaceutical companies resting control of medicalized psilocybin need to learn from and find ways to engage in genuine reciprocity with indigenous communities and support communities of color disproportionately impacted by the drug war. I also believe that it is our moral imperative to immediately end the failed drug war by decriminalizing all drugs, including psilocybin. In a decriminalized world, Folks from traditionally oppressed communities, such as communities of color or queer and trans communities, can create intergenerational models for community-based healing that allow them to create environments genuinely responsive to their needs, 
to build new ritual forms of healing in community that are inspired by but do not appropriate indigenous traditions. As a clinician, I believe decriminalization also offers the opportunity to fully embrace harm reduction. In a decriminalized world, people can speak more openly about the substances they use, those substances can come from safe sources, and people can more broadly access treatment for out-of-control drug use if they need it. In other words, we can support drug users instead of arresting them. And lastly, I want to leave you with this thought, and this is just me speaking as a human being, not as a therapist. I believe that all people have a basic right to cognitive liberty. I believe you should be able to alter your consciousness with plant medicines just because you choose to do so. You should be able to use psilocybin safely and responsibly for your own spiritual development, creativity, or enjoyment because your mind is yours. Sacred plants such as psilocybin mushrooms are a gift to human beings from the earth. They belong to all of us and we all deserve safe access to their gifts of healing. Thank you so much. Wow, Didi, that was fantastic. Um, you should see the comments in the chat box. I love the fact that we've got someone from ACT UP joining in. Um, that's just terrific. Well, I am so excited for our next two speakers. Um, and, and just a reminder, if you have uh, questions or comments that you wanna to direct to Didi, just go to the chat box and put it in there. Um, if she doesn't see them right away, she'll definitely see them. She's gonna be, or um, I'm sorry, Didi, they, uh, I'm really sorry about that. Dee Dee is, is going to be um, posting uh, the links to the studies that they referenced during their talk in the chat box. So um, go ahead and do that. And then you'll be able to see uh, the, the comments from, from your audience. Great. So I'm, I'm really excited to welcome Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal and Assembly Member Pat Burke. Uh, now, Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal represents the 67th Assembly District, which includes the Upper West Side and parts of Hell's Kitchen. Since taking office in 2006, Assemblymember Rosenthal has passed more than 140 laws that have helped to improve the lives of all New York state residents. In 2021, Assemblymember Rosenthal passed legislation into law establishing a medication-assisted treatment program for people battling a substance use disorder in state and local correction, correctional facilities. She is also the co-sponsor of legislation to authorize safer consumption sites throughout New York State, a cause she has championed since 2016. Assemblymember Rosenthal sponsors two bills related to psilocybin, A6065, which is a simple decriminalization bill. It would decriminalize psilocybin by removing it from the list of scheduled substances, and A7928, which would establish the Psychedelic Research Institute and the Psychedelic Substances therapeutic research program charged with studying and providing recommendations regarding the use of psychedelic substances in the treatment of addictive disorders, depression, PTSD, end of life anxiety, and other pertinent outcomes. Um, so that is Assembly Member Rosenthal and Assembly Member Pat Burke hails from Buffalo and was first elected to represent the 142nd Assembly District in 2019. Assembly Member Burke's notable legislative accomplishments include a ban on microbead plastics, a repeal of Sunday blue laws, a multi multi-million dollar emergency fund created to combat the opioid crisis, and the formation of the Erie County Broadband Committee. He also introduced legislation that would make the pharmaceutical industry pay its fair share to keep our local drinking water free of medical waste and not pass the burden onto taxpayers. Assemblymember Burke sponsors A8569, a bill that would amend the public health law to allow for the medical use of psilocybin in a tightly controlled set of circumstances. Um, I am going to ask uh, Assemblymember Rosenthal if she wants to say anything briefly before I start asking both of them any questions, and then I'll do the same with Assemblymember Burke. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Corinne. Um, it's wonderful to see you, and hello to everybody who is tuned in on this uh, tonight. And Didi, uh, you were 
marvelous and uh you need to come to all presentations that we do in Albany um, about this topic. You'll note that Assembly Member Burke and I have the same background, but it's an illusion because we really aren't there together. Um, but it's uh, it's great to see him on this as well. So, um, and I appreciate your inviting me uh, to speak about the work I'm doing in the State Assembly. Um, for those who don't know me, I was elected in 2006, and I represent the 67th Assembly District, which includes the Upper West Side and parts of Hell's Kitchen. Um, I serve as chair of the Social Services Committee, and for five years prior to that, I was chair of the Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. Um, and so, you know, this conversation about decriminalizing psilocybin and having widespread use of it for many reasons is, uh, is evolving in public as we speak in the pages of the New York Times. You know, you can't get more mainstream than that. And so the work that all of you are doing to expand um, the efforts to offer its use to anyone who needs it or wants it in the state, in localities, and around the country is so valuable and will also help to get these bills passed because it's not a conversation that's starting today. The conversation's been ongoing for decades, um, but now we're really zeroing in on how we can make psilocybin available to all of New, all of New York. So thanks for having me. Great, thanks, Assembly Member um, and Assembly Member Burke. I'm up. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, like everyone said, Dee Dee, that was really a fantastic introduction. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, so I come from the the great city of Buffalo, New York. We've got any Buffalo people? Hi. Um, my district is really uh, it, it's sort of a, it's a very blue collar working class district. So uh, I kind of uh, formed my bill in a way that um, I thought would would make sense to them politically. I sort of, you know, I guess I people would say I, I'm pretty progressive. So matching the things I believe in with with sort of those working class blue collar values, it sort of takes it takes some work and it takes some education. Uh, you know, when I communicate what I'm trying to do with my constituents and I find sort of this model of a, a structured model to be sort of the the effective way to communicate that with my constituents and um and i think it's a good way of you know bringing you know real real change uh, to this issue so it's a, like linda said it's a growing it's obviously a, a growing issue it's in the times i was talking to uh, a friend of mine he's running for for senate if we have any uh, pa people he's running for senate uh, uh, John Fetterman, and he's been a great advocate for this issue uh, in Pennsylvania. And so, you know, there's really this movement that's that's happening. I think it, it feels like it's going to happen across the country eventually, no matter what. But I, I want New York to really be on the forefront of that and creating a model that that makes sense for people. So that's what uh, I'm here to to hopefully contribute to today and and going forward. So thank you again for having me. Oh, fantastic. We are so happy that both of you were able to join us tonight. Um, I'm going to ask both of you some questions, and then we're going to see if there are questions in the chat box. Um, Assemblymember Rosenthal, can you tell me, when you first introduced your bill to decriminalize psilocybin, what motivated you to do that? So when, when did you first introduce it, and, and why? Um, well, I first introduced it in um, early 2020. And mm -hmm. You know, I I had been reading about psilocybin and um, drugs in general as chair of the committee on social on, on alcoholism and drug abuse, and um, and really trying to see what what the 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 folks out in the state in the world were um, considering when it came to psilocybin, given it's so many proven um, salutary uses. And I read something about how, you know, a whole laundry list of, of things that were helpful to people. And I said, you know what, 
we have to do this here in New York State. We have to make it easy for people to have access and not be fearful of criminal penalty or even, you know, being thrown in prison because they are using it. And so that's when I introduced the, um, the bill to decriminalize um, psilocybin. And I've worked with many advocates around harm reduction and, um, you know, many issues related to the war on drugs. And this is just another relic of the war on drugs. And we need to eliminate that barrier. Great. Thank you. Um, and Assemblymember Burke, your bill is quite different from Assemblymember Rosenthal's. Can you talk about what your bill would do and what prompted you to introduce it? Sure, I guess. Uh, so what prompted me was there's just a lot of trauma in my community. Like I said, it's, I guess it's, you know, lower, lower income, uh, uh, blue collar community, and a lot of alcoholism, a lot of, you know, violence and uh, I wanted to see how I could help people. And there's a lot of veterans in my community who are dealing with PTSD. And, you know, you can only do so many push-up challenges and the sort of ridiculous stuff where you're like, all right, everything's got to be on the freaking table to help people. And I'm sort of sick of just talking about these things. And wait a minute, I'm in a position to actually do something about it. So uh, I decided I should probably try and do that. So la last year, I started you know, really working on it, put in a bill, and it's continued and the more people you engage with, you sort of, you know, ebb and flow to try and find the sweet spot where you think you can actually get something done. You know, it's sort of one of my frustrating things. I've been in the assembly for four years and I was a county legislator for five years before that. When I was a county legislator, like there's only 11 people. It's like, you got, you got something you want to do, it's like, boom, get it done. You only need to convince six people. Uh, and it's, there's a lot more back and forth in the assembly, the Senate, the governor, uh, so I thought this uh, sort of medical model was sort of a logical step where even having a governor from Buffalo, which is generally a little bit, you know, seemingly a little bit more blue collar conservative than the city, um, I, I felt like, okay, if we're going to get this done. I feel like this is a smart path to do this. So, uh, you know, supervised treatment, I think removing a lot of the stigmatization, you know, with psilocybin and with magic mushrooms and, and sort of getting people comfortable with it seems to be the reasonable first step and to, um, and to show all the benefits, especially, like I said, especially when it comes to, you know, treating anxiety and PTSD and alcoholism. Um, I think if we have the opportunity to, to present it as this really be the beneficial thing that it is, like Dee said, the beneficial thing, it's been for 7,000 years, at least, you know, we can start to, to change that conversation. And that's, that's what I hope it would, it would be a really good first step. Um, for both of you, Assemblymember Burke and Rosenthal, if you're looking at the chat box, you'll see that there's, you know, of course there, there are some frustrated people who are like, why just a medical model? Why is it just limited to this? And this notion of incremental change, as, as you say, Assemblymember Burke, is not new to any um, major social justice issue. In fact, it was the model that advocates chose to advance, well, the model that some advocates chose to advance uh, marijuana decriminalization and now legalization here in New York. Can I have both of you speak to um, the, this, the choices that you're making in terms of incrementalism? And Assemblymember Rosenthal, you and I did a radio interview. Um, that, yes. that interview is, is up on our, our website now. We can post a, a link in the chat box. But mm -hmm. we talked about this because your bill is a straight up decrim bill. And I said, do you think that you know, your colleagues are gonna to wanna to see the studies first. And I loved your answer. Could you share that with our audience tonight? Well, I don't remember exactly what my answer was, but I'd like to mention that I also have a bill to decriminalize buprenorphine, which is used by people with substance use disorder and it helps treat, you know, blocks cravings, prevents withdrawal symptoms, and people have been arrested for carrying some of it in their pockets where, or using it in prison when it's a drug that helps them. So when I introduced the um, opioid overdose center bill in 2016, it my knowledge was based on years, decades of practical use in other countries. Switzerland 30 years ago had OPCs. And at the time we called them SIFs, safe injection facilities, but now it's OPCs. Um, 
And I thought, we don't need really to prove what has already been proven across the world. The same thing with psilocybin. You know, we have more than enough evidence from 7,000 years of use, but also very mainstream um, universities, for example, um, where researchers say, yes, this works, we've seen it work. And we have thousands of people's testimonies that say, this works for me. So that's good enough for me to say, let's stop with the interim steps in, in terms of decriminalization, because that always prolongs um, the ultimate goal. And I think we've waited long enough uh, to decriminalize uh, psilocybin. So I think, you know, that approach is what I try. I try to do the goal first. Sometimes you're forced to step back and go more slowly, but I'm not going to, um, you know, put myself in a compromising position at the get-go. At the get-go, you go for your goal. Then we'll see what obstacles come before us, but I'm not going to, you know, bargain against myself um, mm -hmm. by putting in something that I think doesn't need to be there. Assemblymember Burke, do you want to address the question too? Uh, can, can you repeat? I, we, well, sure, just sorry. just speaking to the um, the incrementalist approach, there's always been sort of this tension in advocacy communities of whether you go for something that you think, you know, the broadest number of your colleagues will be in favor of and do that quickly and then and then move from there or do you go as uh, assembly member rosenthal said you go i don't know if she said this but you go for the gold i said that oh I, hey yeah. i would hey go for the gusto if you can get it done but yeah. but we're, we've i mean we've uh, we haven't right if we could get it if it were that easy it'd be done but mm -hmm. and there are so many things in our society and in our government that should be one way and are another way and unfortunately most of the times it's based on politics, it's based on public opinion and the reaction of elected officials to respond to their constituents. If it were easy, it'd just be done. And, and so, you know, I, I view it as, you know, the right approach, especially if this is not in the public sphere, in the, I, I don't think that like a, a article in the Times or it's not an ether where I, I don't think the public broadly is, just in favor of this. If you pulled, if you pulled for this, I think it would, I think it would pull negatively, maybe outside of New York City, probably. So I think these, I, I hate being a practical politician, but it's part of what we have to do to negotiate to get things done. I think this is the smartest approach to expose this to the public to prove that all the benefits and then go forward. And we saw it with marijuana and cannabis. We saw you know, like the trajectory of that. You know, it, it was incremental and for you know, everyone wants what they want right away. But, you know, I, I would say don't let, you know, perfect be the enemy of good. If we can get something done, get it done. I, I don't agree with negotiating against ourselves or, you know, we would already have it done. Um, so in my experiences, even, even with cannabis, that was a, that was a massive fight. And I think this is a little bit more difficult than cannabis to get done. So I think this is a smart approach. Well, the question that's on everyone's minds in the chat box is whether whether and when these bills can pass. Um, and I know that that's kind of that's that is a big question. Um, New York has a two year legislative cycle. And if the bills aren't passed by June 2nd this year, they will die and they'll have to be reintroduced next year. Can both of you say a few words to this group about what needs to happen to get these bills to the finish line? I mean, Assemblymember Rosenthal, you've worked on bills that have been pending in the legislature for decades, um, and sometimes it takes that long. What's it going to take from the public to pass these bills? Well, first of all, the reason it hasn't been done is because nobody went for it. Nobody introduced a bill to do it. So that's why I did it and why Pat did it, because there weren't, wasn't anyone who was either interested or informed about it. So now that it's out there, I'm talking with the health chair to see Dick Gottfried, who is retiring um, after this year, and um, they're quite interested in this. Um, 
but every two years, yes, we have to run for re-election. And if we're re-elected, then we have to reintroduce all the bills that didn't pass in the previous two-year session. So yes, every year um, I introduce the ones that, that haven't passed and that I think are still worth uh, pursuing. But the way the bill would proceed is it would go, um, the committee it's referenced to, in this case, the health committee, would have to be on an agenda there and be passed out of that committee. Uh, it would then go to a codes committee because it does involve uh, changing the, you know, the, the legal, the, yeah, what, whatever, what is it called? Uh, the, the criminal code. And uh, then it would probably go to the floor and we'd have to corral enough votes. Um, but, you know, I think people are becoming much more interested in this. And uh, that's how bills go. I, I, I was the sponsor of the Child Victims Act uh, and it took 13 years to pass. Someone else had it before me and she retired. And then I took it. Sometimes bills that are hard take a long time. Government's always behind society. Just look at technology law. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I work hard the way I do on all these bills. And, uh, and also we have the benefit here of so many advocates who wanna see this bill passed. And that's another advantage that this bill has, is that it's got an extremely enthusiastic uh, support base that will help uh, educate legislators about it. Well, I'm, I'm really excited that Luke Grandis is with us tonight from right. Vocal New York. And when we get to the community discussion part, I'm gonna ask to highlight Luke's videos so that um, they can tell us about you know, how to get active on this issue and so many others that they're championing in this, uh, in this area. Um, Assembly member Burke, do you want to say anything? Cause then I, I want to introduce a special guest that we have from the area on, uh, on the zoom tonight. Assembly yeah, member Burke. Sure. Uh, just quickly, I think, uh, you know, I just to sort of piggyback on what Linda said, you know, that, that is the appropriate process. Uh, and I think it's actually helpful having two of us on, different ends of the state, you know, maybe we can meet in Troy and, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, she marches from New York City, I'll march from Buffalo and, you know, we'll come, you know, I don't really care how, I just want to see it get done. So I like my model, but if there's a better model, I'm not, I'm not, you know, whichever, whichever is the best way to make this, you know, a reality is what I want to see. Um, and then in, in just observing the cannabis model, it started, I think, taking off once, frankly, we were in financial dire straits as a state. And there was an industry model that was presented that, you know, it created a new, new opportunities and new industry, which put more energy and effort behind it across the state. So I think also presenting this as not just something that is good for people and, you know, a, a new, you know, new health opportunities, but there is a whole possible industry that can create you know, jobs and opportunities for people, I think is really, really important. So, uh, you know, the advocacy part of it, that has to be, a, you know, a big, a big, a, a big component. So, you know, looking forward to help, helping organize some of that as well. So I'll be, you know, me and Linda, once we get back to Albany, we're gonna have to compare notes and, and see how we can, you know, help make this a reality in the assembly. And I think just, you're gonna I just, have- can I just yeah, add that having Pat in, in Buffalo and me in the city actually helps the cause because they can't say, oh, it's a crazy New York City person or, <laughs> you know, a person from upstate. It's like a joint effort. Yeah. And uh, it shows that there's support from Buffalo to New York City and we'll capture everyone in between together. That is awesome. Well, I thank both of you for being on this uh, in this event tonight, um, for sponsoring the legislation, for answering these questions. And I am sure that you're gonna hear from a lot of the folks uh, that are tuned into this meeting tonight. Um, we have a special guest who I didn't know was gonna be joining us tonight. And it's now that the lines have been redrawn for legislative districts, this guy represents me. And I'm so excited to introduce him to you. Assembly member John McDonald is on the, is on the meeting as well. Um, can we highlight his video? Do you wanna say a few words? Sure, Hi, Kareen, how are you? And good evening, everybody, and to Pat and Linda. Uh, thank you. Um, 
You know, it's interesting for those who do not know me, um, I do represent the capital region. I'm also a pharmacist. I'm one of maybe two or three healthcare professionals in the legislature. Um, as Linda knows and Pat's gotten to know, um, you know, I'm kind of from a moderate part of our capital region. However, on certain things, um, I look at things from a clinical lens versus looking at it from the political lens. And it's been interesting because in my clinical readings, I've been seeing more and more information the last two or three years coming from peer reviewed documents about the potential for psychedelics. Um, you know, I joined the assembly 10 years ago. I remember, and Linda and I joke about this, her dragging me down, literally dragging me down to go look at um, what was then called self injection sites, which we now call opioid prevention centers. I remember saying to her, Linda, I can't stand it. I don't like the idea, but you know what? I'm gonna look at every single person who lost a child and say, there's one thing I can guarantee you, your child would not have died if the opioid prevention center was there. So to kind of capture a little bit about what Linda and Pat are talking about, it does take members time to really understand this because at the end of the day, whereas each of, or many of you are advocates and driven by this, which is admirable and thankful. The reality is we each have about 130,000 constituents in our district that we need to answer to. And therefore it does take a little bit of time to get information together, to really understand the, you know, the pros and the cons. Um, I personally have seen more information coming out about the clinical benefit to those individuals who have been had the most difficult time for treatment. And as mentioned earlier, people who've had uh, trauma early in their life. That's something that we as a society are much more aware of today than we were five to 10 years ago. So um, I was, don't know why, I think Kareem just puts me on all these email lists just to keep me in, in vogue here. Um, I remember last week seeing this and I saw Linda and Pat's name. I've actually sent them some information from my medical reading just to kind of help bring this uh, conversation to a higher level. Because I think it does have merit. It needs to be considered. Um, you know, when I first got to the assembly, I jumped on the medical marijuana bill right off the bat. And my district did not really care for that. But I said to them, you can either allow things to keep going the way they are we can actually start off with a controlled environment and see where we go from there. And yes, it's led to the legalization of marijuana in New York state. But from my perspective, as a person who's seen so many families lose people, we've seen so many people also be wrongly incarcerated. The reality is I would rather have individuals work with something that's a known entity that comes from a certain quality so they know what they're getting as opposed to what street drugs normally do, which are erratic. Um, and that's, yeah. I don't want to get into that long conversation about that. Yeah. But, so I wanted to just, you know, thank Pat and Linda for their leadership. Karina is always, um, you always get me involved with some very interesting conversations, <laughs> that's for damn sure. But, you know, <laughs> as one of the few health professionals, I, I think there's merit to this conversation. And I look forward to working with my colleagues. Well, thank you so much for responding to my invitation to join tonight. It was really nice to hear from you. Um, and I'm glad that we have an ally in the capital regions. So now we've got upstate, downstate, and uh, the middle of the state. So we should be good to go. You just need to get the rest of your, what, two, 211 colleagues on board. Um, Karen, Karen, as, as, a Buffalo, <laughs> as a Buffalo person and all my Buffalo people, we're, we're not upstate. We are Western New York. We're very. <laughs> True I don't that. care. I don't, I'm not offended. I just like I, to stick up. I am chagrined. <laughs> I went to school in Buffalo, and I'm embarrassed now. All so. right. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining us, and I'm sure you're going to be hearing from people. I'm going to turn it over to uh, my co-host Eileen to introduce our next speaker, and you'll hear from me again in a minute. Hadass Alderman is an attorney and is the co-founder of Plant Medicine Law Group, a woman-owned law firm serving the psychedelic and cannabis in industries. She is a founding board member of the Psychedelic Bar Association and a board member of the American Psychedelic Practitioner Association. She also serves 
on the Equity Subcommittee of the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board. I'm going to turn this over to my co-host, Corinne, to have a discussion with Hadass. Hadass, I am, I am so excited that you're on here. I know that people are already asking in the chat box, where else has this been done? So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that are that will get our, uh, our participants the answers that they're looking for. You know, the 1970 Controlled Substances Act banned the use of psilocybin and other psychedelic drugs. Was it legal before then to cultivate, possess, use, and share a psilocybin? So... First of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and second of all, short answer is yes. As Dee, Dee mentioned in the late 1950s, R. Gordon Wasson goes to Oaxaca and participates in what he calls a magic mushroom ritual um, with Maria Sabina. He comes back to the United States and in 1957, he publishes the now famous photo essay of his experience in Life Magazine. And he sends a sample of the mushrooms to a Swiss chemist named Albert Hoffman, who 80 years ago today was the first person to synthesize LSD. So in 1958, Albert Hoffman synthesized psilocybin in his lab at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, and Sandoz starts producing psilocybin. So for the next decade or so, Thousands of doses of psilocybin are legally administered in trials um, by scientists and doctors who think that it could be useful for treating things like depression and addiction. Um, and this window of time is also, for example, when the Harvard Psilocybin Project does the Good Friday experiment to see if psilocybin would occasion mystical states for divinity school students. Um, so, you know, research and use is happening all over the place, and it is, in fact, legal. But in 1965, Sandoz stops producing psilocybin and LSD, and from what I've read, this was actually just a result of um, increased pharmaceutical industry regulations. A few years earlier, a sedative called thaliamide was found to have caused tens of thousands of fetal abnormalities. And so as a response to that, government agencies in the US and abroad decided that they needed to regulate the process of all drug development in a much more controlled manner. So. Then, in 1966, the federal government starts pumping the brakes on psychedelic research here. But at that point, the fascination with and enthusiasm for psychedelics and their potential had completely escaped the lab, so to speak. And by 1967, you have Timothy Leary in Golden Gate Park telling people to turn on, tune in, and drop out. So by that point, Recreational psychedelics have alchemized with the late 60s zeitgeist and the counterculture and the anti-war movement and Nixon being um, very anxious about saving face in Vietnam finds it politically expedient to marginalize anti-war protesters. And in 1968, possession of psilocybin became illegal under the Staggers-Dodd Act, but it wasn't heavily enforced. And then in 1970, Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act. And that's a super abridged summary of a lot of complex historical events. And I don't mean to essentialize, but hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, and I'm sure that others will have uh, follow up questions in the chat. I don't know if anyone else noticed, but when Assemblymember McDonald said that he saw a bunch of research coming across his desk on the beneficial uses of psilocybin, um, Dee Dee was populating the chat box with all of the citations to the studies. So I, I found that that funny that he was saying that while the citations were popping up. But, you know, as we heard from Didi and saw in the chat box, um, you know, research from leading institutions in the U.S. and abroad have been consistently demonstrating the profound benefits of psilocybin in treating very difficult to treat mental health conditions. The culture and the legal landscape is changing in response. How many jurisdictions, Hadas, have taken action to decriminalize the substance and how have they done it? So I love that question. And I want to start out being picky about semantics because I'm a lawyer, so I have to. Um, what we often hear about as being 
decriminalization in this context is not. It's deprioritization. So 11 jurisdictions have made the use and possession of entheogens the lowest law enforcement priority, meaning that they're diverting justice and law enforcement resources away from enforcing existing drug laws. But the laws themselves, the criminal codes, don't change. They just deprioritize enforcing them. But that does not minimize the value of this kind of organizing. These resolutions are like shooting off flares. I think about it as the dark mark from Harry Potter, but instead of a Death Eater's face in the sky, it's a mushroom. Each resolution that gets passed sends a signal to lawmakers, to the medical establishment, to law enforcement, to investors, and to other activists and to psychonauts um, that there are a lot of people who want to use psychedelics and who are using psychedelics, often very safely and effectively, and that there is the political will to allow for that. These, these resolutions have been instrumental, I think, in changing the discourse around psychedelics, and they've contributed to destigmatization in a really impressive way. It's a, it's a good cultural lever to pull. And then by contrast, true legal decriminalization is a reduction in criminal penalties or an elimination thereof, um, typically for possession and or use. So one example of that is Measure 110 in Oregon, which decriminalized non-commercial uh, drug possession. So uh, what used to be a misdemeanor is now a class E violation. You pay a $100 fine or you agree to do um, a, a health screening. So it's like choosing between a moving violation or traffic school instead of a criminal offense. Um, the issue with decriminalization in my opinion, is that you still have an unregulated upstream market when you only allow for um, personal possession. The production side of the supply chain is still underground, meaning you can't regulate it. You can't hold guides for psilocybin-assisted therapy to certain standards, and you can't enforce the consequences um, when those, those standards are violated. For synthetic substances, um, an unregulated marketplace means that most people um, in a decriminalized jurisdiction don't know what's in their drugs unless they have drug tests, which is dangerous. And, and so that's where um, legalization comes in, if you want to talk about legal pathways. Yeah, I mean, how are there any states that have done just full on legalization? And I mean, do we have states or jurisdictions that have looked at the kind of bill like the one that Assemblymember Rosenthal has proposed, which would take psilocybin out of the state's criminal code? Yeah, so I think in, in talking about psilocybin legalization, um, it's helpful to think about these state level models. Um, and. Oregon's Measure 109 is a really good example, and also the first and currently the only legalization uh, model. And um, it's also known as the Psilocybin Services Act. And under it, the Oregon Health Authority is going to be regulating the production and testing and distribution and sale of psilocybin. But it's also going to very closely regulate context of consumption. So one could not, under Measure 109, purchase psilocybin as a good to consume on one's own terms. So like at home or at the beach, for example. Under the act, um, an adult may only ingest psilocybin at a licensed service center and only under the supervision of a licensed facilitator. So it isn't really a recreational adult use framework, but it's also not medical because the facilitator doesn't need to be a doctor. They do need to be state certified as a facilitator in accordance with the standards that are going to that are promulgated, you know, in the act and by the regulations. Um, and similarly, the participant doesn't need a prescription or a diagnosis, but they do need to attend a preparation session, which is basically going to be like a screening. Um, and they'll have the option to attend integration sessions after the psilocybin session. So again, it's not medical use, but it's not recreational either. Um, and it, it's, it's not both. It's really neither. It's its own paradigm. Um, and then if you want to talk about a true medical model, that's where FDA clinical trials come in. 
Interesting. Well, from what you've seen on the ground, Hadas, what made some of those efforts successful? Uh, for example, what are the ingredients that a grassroots movement of activists needs to pull together to make uh, to make the legislature move on these measures? That's a really good question. Um, and I don't know that there's there's a secret sauce. And I would imagine that it varies from you know, one jurisdiction to the next and, and over time. But what I can say is within this movement, first of all, people have been at this for a really long time. So um, again, as Didi mentioned in their talk at the very beginning, people have been using psilocybin and carrying this medicine often at great personal risk to themselves all over the world um, for thousands of years. Um, and I think that we're sort of standing on their shoulders, so to speak. And I think there is something about acknowledging that, that I find, you know, that makes everything feel um, stronger and more grounded. And there's like a resonance to that, that I find impactful. Um, and then I would also say, you know, there are so many different paths that are being pursued right now. There's right to try, there's FDA clinical trials, there's deprioritization, decriminalization, legalization, there's sacramental use under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, and I think that oftentimes activists can fall into a trap of infighting and trying to, you know, whether people are scrambling for resources or attention, um, people really want to see their side win. And I think what we need to remember is that the differences that exist between us and our varying um, paths of preference and, and rates of change that we would like to see within the psychedelic movement and drug policy change generally are so minuscule and in some ways relatively inconsequential when we compare ourselves um, as a unified movement or group of people to the people that don't want to see this change at all, um, mm -hmm. to the people that don't want to decriminalize anything, to the people who think that the FDA clinical trials are invalid, to the people who think, you know, religious freedoms as they pertain to psychedelics aren't important. Um, and there are a lot of those people out there. You know, I think that um, we often get caught in the psychedelic bubble and forget that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resistance that's been mounted for a long time. And I think remaining really unified is incredibly important. And, and to that point, um, and I think this is something that assembly member Burke touched on, one of my favorite things about working in this space and being involved in various um, policy initiatives and, and observing others is the bipartisan aspect. Um, of these movements and of these various initiatives. I think that it's something that's so needed for the healing of this country and of the world. And so I think the fact that we have something where people who otherwise may not have much in common can really come together is incredibly impactful. Uh, I think when we rely on the things that you know keep us um, separate, as political weapons, we might get the result we want in the short term, but in the long term, I think that we really lose. Wow. Well, um, I have so much I want to say and ask. I feel like I need more hadas. <laughs> I'm sure other people in this meeting do too. We, we do have to move on, but I'm actually wondering if I could invite you to put some comments in the chat about where we can get some more hadas. Like, where are you speaking and what have you written and do you blog? <laughs> you know, like, I, I just want to learn more from you. Um, and I hope we don't lose you because I bet there's going to be some questions. Uh, uh, in in the um, in the community discussion here, but you know your your what you just said about bipartisanship and and needing to reach beyond these divisions that are separating us. I had a great interview that again aired on the Sanctuary for Independent Media's Hudson Mohawk Magazine with Jesse Gould and um, our tech people. I don't know if you if Jesse is has made it. He was on a flight uh, and he got delayed, but we had invited him to participate as well. He founded the Heroic Hearts Project, um, which is a group of veterans, and I think those folks are going to be instrumental in bridging the gap between parties and really bringing us together because it's. Um, you know, it's it's vets mobilizing that could really help propel legislation in New York forward, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that 
um, when I think about, you know, the veteran involvement in this space, it's, it's been so critical. It's been so impactful. Um, and it's so important that we don't, uh, just take from them and not make sure that we're giving, we're, um, we're delivering, sorry, mm. no, I'm crying. we're delivering on what, on what we're promising them. Um, because I think that that's, you know, um, it's the right thing to do. And it didn't necessarily go that way in, in, in cannabis in every context. And I think it's just, you know, it's important to name and I'm really grateful for people like Jesse doing what he does. Yeah. Wow. Well, Hadas, tell us uh, in the chat box where to find you in the future and get more of your wisdom. And now um, we are a little bit behind schedule, but not not too bad. I'm going to turn it over back over to Eileen, my co-host, to introduce our next speaker. Pami Jackson is the co-founder, the the founder, I'm sorry, Pami, don't, don't kill me, <laughs> is the founder and executive director of the women's led nonprofit organization, the Psychedelic Sisterhood. Pami started the Psychedelic Sisterhood to provide women with a safe space to discuss, learn, and share experiences about the healing power of psychedelics and reclaim the association of medicinal plants as their original indigenous source. Offering an inclusive environment to thrive and grow, the Psychedelic Sisterhood also collaborates with like-minded organizations for psychedelic advocacy and to support drug policy reform. So let's hear from somebody that actually can tell us uh, her experience um, using psilocybin and how um, her life got changed with the use of medicinal plants. So Pami, can you tell us what the Psychedelic Sisterhood is and what led you to found it? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so the Psychedelic Sisterhood uh, is an organization for women to get together and uh, kind of have a space to, sorry, I got a little starstruck, <laughs> um, to have a little space for um, doing psychedelic, well, speaking about psychedelics, speaking about the experiences and having a safe space to kind of, um, discuss and without judgment and, and and be able to you know feel like you can speak about things without you know have, feeling like you have two heads you know i think that's really important that people feel accepted in a space and feel open enough to speak about their experiences and with the war of on drugs that has been raging for more than 50 years. And despite some claims that it's over, drug possession is the number one arrest in America. Close to three times the number of arrests for all violent offenses combined. Few people are getting arrested for magic mushrooms. So when we talk about the criminalizing psilocybin, some people argue that this is a white person issue. What is at stake for people of color, black and brown community, in the discussion about legalizing or decriminalizing psilocybin and other psychedelics? Well, I think there's definitely a disparaging number of black and brown people being, um, you know, taken to you know, prison and having, you know, their, uh, I don't know the word, they, they're having to um, have their, um, I guess, the, in the Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Stumbling. Don't worry. You're uh, fine. <laughs> but yeah, but I 100% I um, agree with that. Um, I think that there is um, a moment where we're hoping that psilocybin can be decriminalized and or legalized, um, hopefully more on the decriminalization side pertaining to regulations. I know had also speaking about regulations and things need to be very specifically have, you know, rules. Um, which I agree with uh, to an extent. I think on a medical side, that makes more sense when you're um, synthesizing psilocybin and making pressed pills, then, then it becomes a, a tricky situation. However, on the decriminalization side, when you're able to grow and, and gather and gift, I think that seems to me more 
something that's more of a beneficial uh, use of, of psilocybin. Um, I think that it would work better in the long run as far as, you know, as far as like, you know, if you're legalizing your legalizing uh, psilocybin, it's like legalizing stuff that's in your garden. And it's like, why would you regulate your cilantro? You know, if we're really going to look at psilocybin as a healing herb or healing medicine, um, then let's treat it like that. Let's treat it like we're like how we feel about cannabis, even though cannabis in New York is legalized. And there's a lot of regulation for that. That's kind of something I'm worried that psilocybin will go through if it is legalized. I think there's going to be a ton of paperwork and, and millions of dollars worth of, um, you know, licenses that you'll need to grow and sell and people that just want to grow for themselves will be very like limited and aside from the fact that psilocybin is an illegal substance there are both religious cult cultural and societal barriers to the idea of using psilocybin in communities of color can you talk a little bit about that um yeah i think so um there is a huge different uh, societal norms as far as, you know, spaces of color and, and other spaces. I think from my perspective, from my personal background, I come from um, a very religious background. I'm not religious anymore, but I grew up very religious. And I noticed that a lot of people in my culture um, were afraid of psychedelics in a sense where, where in, in religion, I suppose it's, not accepted as much and that's where the judgment comes in which is why i thought it was really important to kind of build a group like this um so i think that there's a huge um there's definitely a huge difference um depending where you grow up um, or where you know where your society is Mm -hmm. And for many of the conditions that we have heard about tonight, PTSD, anxiety, depression, sexual trauma, and even substance use that has become problematic, talk therapy has been the predominant modality of treatment, or at least the most widely and easily accessible. Some folks may hear about the benefits of psilocybin and think that they, they are an excuse for the use of magic mushrooms, but a magical cure all by themselves. But integration work, and we spoke about that in the interview that I did with you, that is so important to the efficacy of this substance. Integration work isn't just talk therapy. Can you talk a little bit, <laughs> what is the difference and how important is psychedelic integration? Yes, absolutely. Um, if I can speak briefly about my own personal experience, um, I was in talk therapy for years and I didn't realize there were, you know, a few things that I couldn't get to. Like, you know, you go to therapy, you hope the therapist can like kind of suss you out and you can start, you know, doing your work. But I had so much in my subconscious that I couldn't access. And it wasn't until I started my psychedelic journey was I able to like bring up these things and take it to my therapist. And from there, um, I started a whole new kind of chapter of healing. And in saying that, I, that's where I'm such an advocate for psychedelic therapy and, psych and counseling and integration work. Um, I know the medical side of things, what, what scares me, and again, it's my fear may not happen, but what I'm hoping I'm not predicting is there will be a campaign for a quick fix drug if psilocybin is, um, you know, given in a pill, like, oh, you're depressed, take this pill, call me in the morning, you know, I, I hope that's not the case. And, um, and I would really love more information and more education about psychedelics being only part of the process, maybe a third of the process and integration and work and a routine is so much more of the effort. And it's, it's not a quick fix, um, no matter what substance it is, no matter how much you take, you're not gonna have it and be like, oh, I'm done, I'm good, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not gonna happen. It's the work that comes after it. The things that come up will just be there. You're like, oh, I found this thing out. But if you're not working through it, 
then you're still going to be in the same place that you were before you took it. <laughs> Thank you, Pame, for sharing your experience with us. I, we really appreciate it. And I'm going to turn this over to my co-host, Corinne. Oh, Pammy, that was fantastic. Can you um, let folks know in the chat box how to connect with the Psychedelic Sisterhood? Absolutely. You can go to Instagram. I'm at Psychedelic Sisterhood, or you can email me directly at the Psychedelic Sisterhood at gmail.com. Great. We are so lucky that you were able to join us tonight. Thank you, especially after your bicycle ride through the Oh city. my gosh, my legs. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> We're going to hear a little bit. We're going to hear a little bit more about that when we turn uh, turn it over to the watch party in Brooklyn. But um, let's go to another Brooklynite. Brooklyn-based Noah Potter is a psychedelic policy consultant who joined the psychedelic legalization movement in 1993. He writes the blog Psychedelic Law. He has worked to call attention to the racial disparities of drug law enforcement and in 2020 co-founded an advocacy group dedicated to psychedelic law reform in New York. He has advised the Decriminalized Denver campaign and advocates immediate, safe, and equitable, which means affordable, culturally relevant, and non-exploitative access to, to the psychedelic experience for anyone anywhere who could benefit from it. Noah, can you help tie what we've heard tonight together and cap us off before we turn to our audience for questions and discussion? Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a very special event. Um, we'll offer some opinions on that. Uh, tying things together. Um, yeah, I do my best and I actually wrote out a, a fair amount of talking points. Um, um, and I, I will say, I had thought that this was going to be an introductory talk, perhaps for people who are not familiar with psychedelics and specifically psilocybin, but I'm getting the sense that uh, everybody here has uh, been in the psychedelic space, has some familiarity for the most part, so I'm probably going to skip out on some of the basic stuff. Um, tying things together, that's a, that's a difficult task. I guess the, the overall point um, and I'll try to, then I'll get into some specific comments, is uh, the, the, the hybrid and potentially contradictory nature of this phenomena. Um, it's, it's like the famous elephant and the blind man. Uh, it's so big and it's so different that just getting a handle on the nature of the thing is a fundamental challenge. Um, partly, I think, because there's no context in Eurocentric post-Enlightenment society for a psychedelic phenomena. Uh, and, and psilocybin and peyote and cannabis in particular, as naturally occur and I potentially bufotinin as well, as naturally occurring psychedelic substances. Um, tying together some things, and we have the, obviously have the issue of incrementalism, um, yes or no. Um, there's some reference to the variety of categorizations of psychedelics from the medical use to the sacramental use, and then to what I would call self-directed use, which is um, what we all know in the legacy market and the legacy movement know, which is you figure it out yourself. You have peer education. People learn how to use psychedelics safely. Um, they understand, they, uh, you know, some people don't. But for the majority, more people do learn how to use them safely, uh, which calls into question the need for onerous regulation, um, and it, which itself is part of the misunderstanding and lack of familiarity of psychedelic substances. Uh, discussion of the degree to which psychedelics will um, can can move, um, whether it's going to be as difficult to to move them as cannabis. I'd say. Uh, no, counterintuitively, no. Psychedelics, I think, are probably easier to move than cannabis for a variety of reasons. Uh, I mean, there are decades of political struggle that go into explaining why that's the case. Uh, but all indications are that psychedelics are rocketing past cannabis, um, again, for a variety of reasons. But um, we see how fast they're moving. Um, I was involved in the Denver campaign in 2018, uh, did my part to help get the, the measure on the ballot, uh, and then step back to let the people on the ground move. But uh, when Denver got on the ballot, 
decriminalized nature picked up in Oakland and hit multiple jurisdictions. Uh, and it was clear that this was a thing. Uh, and uh, to quote myself, one of the things that Denver showed was that there is a psychedelic constituency. There is a political significance to psychedelics and there's a population that's in support of policy reform. Um, and Oregon, the measure 109 was already in the works. It had been prepared, it had been prepared for years, but um, with the, the foundation laid by the local movements, um, you know, it created the buzz in the context for measure 109. Um, so, I mean, those are just a couple of, uh, you know, a, a couple of pieces in terms of synthesis. There's, there's more to be done, more to say. Um, first of all, uh, let me say, I want to acknowledge some of the other activists who are on the call. I mean, I don't know who everybody is, but there are some stalwarts and I want to recognize my, uh, my mentor and teacher, Dana Beale, who's on the call, uh, Brett Waters, George Carter, um, there's some Avishai effect in, uh, in, in Buffalo, and I don't know if I'm going to hit everybody, um, but, but there's a, uh, there, and uh, Sheva in, in Denver, there's a, there's a, it's a star-studded program, even just in terms of the people who are tuning in. Um, so I want to say, just, I guess, first of all, Corinne, do you have any questions for me before I launch? No, I, I, I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so this is a very special event. Um, I think different from most of the webinars and, uh, to which, which I've viewed because in, it's so New York specific. And we're really, because of the presence of the, of the, of the legislators in particular, uh, and the fact that I think almost every, basically everybody on the call is New York based, uh, that makes it unique because we are primed to set a framework for change in a very significant jurisdiction, the state itself. Uh, and the state, therefore, this state joins a host of states. I mean, the, this is psychedelics are moving at rocket speed because bills are being introduced everywhere. Now they range from descheduling and decriminalization through research bills, through psilocybin assisted therapy bills, um, various forms of research bills, I should say, to the most uh, limited, I guess, which would be a right to try. I mean, I guess paired with the very simple bill like Connecticut, which is simply to create a, a, a study group. Um, but this is, so we, we're, this is a great foundation, a great found, uh, architecture for building something in New York. Uh, and it's very significant that it's being organized upstate as opposed to being down in the north, you know, the usual suspect downstate bubble. Uh, so which is part of why this is so super encouraging because we have now, we have already now have a, huge, a network, a strong network all across the state. And I've, I've seen the comments about engaging with legislators. I mean, if everybody were to pick up and engage with their senator, their, uh, the state senator, state uh, assembly member, identify their local electeds, uh, identify all the, 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 the parts of the web from top to bottom. On my, on my website, Legal Market Strategies, I love three-dimensional chess because we're not playing on one horizontal plane. We're playing on, a, on probably four different planes, local, state, federal, and then within the international system. Uh, and all those pieces are, all those elements are in motion. Uh, and the more that you connect among them, the, the I guess, the more of the mycelial web that you have. Um, so just a, a comment about the, uh, why this is a particularly important um, event. And Corinne, you've opened the door, I think, in a very big way to the extent that people pick up and move this forward. Um, I want to say um, uh, just a word to acknowledge the time in which we're living. Um, we're here talking about psychedelics. That's great. I'm, I've been in this space for going on 30 years. Uh, it's kind of like a dream come true to be in this time. Um, but uh, looking all around us, Homo sapiens, our species, uh, is looking like it's in kind of a bad way. Uh, the news is very bad. I would say uh, to a large extent, everywhere you look on the, the global scale, uh, we may have good moments in our personal lives and, and our, in our environments and our community and so on, but there's some pretty bad stuff that's going on out there. Um, and of course, what happened, you know, Homo sapiens, um, we have a species relationship. We have an intraspecies uh, set of problems and what we do affects the other species on the planet. So I'll get into that in a minute. 
But I just want to like name that this is a very troubling moment. Um, I don't, you know, it's difficult to believe. I mean, I've seen this moment of, of difficulty and despair and potential catastrophe because we have a, an unerring ability to destroy ourselves. Uh, we see that constantly. But now it looks like we're going to really able to do that on a collective scale. Um, so I want to name the, the stress and anxiety of the moment as we watch things unfold around us. And then what is that? And the question is, well, what does that have to do with our conversation? Um, and what does it have to do with the nature of the program? It's been uh, it's been designed. I want to say, you know, going to the topic of uh, the prohibition of the mind, the first part of the title of this program. Uh, I'm going to quote myself in a sense. I mean, I I blog. I've been blogging at uh, New Amsterdam Psychedelic Law or PsychedelicLaw.com since 2010, um, and. Um, uh, I mean, I've got works going back to 2010 and tracing the evolution of cannabis politics uh, and then getting more into psychedelics. Um, but to quote myself, I wrote a piece, I put up a piece in um, uh, May of 2012 called, that I called Only We Know the Truth About You. And it comes out of uh, a part of a, the, uh, a DEA um, ruling on a rescheduling petition on cannabis. Um, it's particular to cannabis, but cannabis is, in a sense, a form of, the psych of a psychedelic substance. Uh, it's a very intriguing form of psychedelic substance with a lot of unique uh, characteristics. Um, but, uh, you know, this is applicable generally. So this was a piece, uh, a section of the decision, as you'd expect, by the DEA denying a cannabis rescheduling petition. Uh, and it quote, referred back to an earlier um, an earlier decision by the DEA. Um, and, and one of the, the, the issues, one of the legal concepts is that I mean, one way of coming at drug control is, first of all, it's a, it's a mutated form of consumer protection. That's a conversation for another time. But the, over, the origin of, of drug control was consumer protection coming out of the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act uh, to respond to the problems in the market through Sorry to say, folks, lack of regulation, which is just as simple as a lack of disclosure of the ingredients uh, on, on psychoactive products being sold in the marketplace, uh, patent medicines that were just uh, you know, loaded up with, with cocaine or cannabis and then sold as you know, grandmother's remedy. Um, so, so first, so the starting point is that the one deconstruction is, it's really where this, this grew out of consumer protection into a monster, a carnivorous monster that's devoured millions of lives. Um, so just to see how, how creep, how the, the mission creep can move. Um, the, the DEA, in the DEA's decision, the DEA said that uh, there are a number of reasons why anecdotal evidence, and that's the legal hook, the government doesn't recognize the anecdotal experience of the individual user uh, or even the, the, the medical provider, again, for a variety of reasons. But that is our starting point, is that the government denies the validity of the individual's subjective experience. Um, and so the DEA gave four different reasons why it rejects anecdotal evidence. And I'm gonna pick two. The first one, uh, and you can find this on my blog, Only We Know the Truth About You, and I have a link to the DEA decision itself. First, two out of four. First, sick people are not objective scientific observers, especially when it comes, when it comes to their own health. They don't really know what's best for them. And third, the, the, the third of the, of the four reasons, any mind-altering drug can make a sick person think he feels better. So they just process that. The person undergoing the subjective experience doesn't really feel better. He just thinks he's feeling better. Um, and for me, that, that em, that's emblematic of the degree of control and the nature of the prohibition of the mind, the denial of the validity of the subjective experience. Um, and you know, and so you know, I'm, I'm glad that we came up with the, 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 the talk incorporates the idea of the prohibition of the mind. And I would say I'm, I'm hearing the comments about the freedom, cognitive liberty and so on. Um, and, and I'll like spin that a little bit. Uh, I would just suggest that freedom of consciousness is an implicit predicate to all the other freedoms of the First Amendment. 
You can't have freedom of speech or freedom of religion, or freedom of anything else without freedom of consciousness. Because you can't, if, if you have freedom of speech, but no freedom of consciousness, then you're free to say whatever I say is okay to say. Um, and the same thing with practice. So it's, 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 it's implicit. It's the predicate to everything else. Um, so this is a swing to, to the second piece of the title. This is a mushroom symposium. Now, symposium, my understanding is it comes from the Greek of drinking together. Just little footnote, you know, pot, when we say pot, pot actually comes from potassium, drinking. Um, there's, I guess, a little bit of story of how that happened, but so that same root shows up in symposium. And what does that bring us to? It comes to, it brings us to the idea of psychoactive mushrooms as psychoactive food. And now it's similar in this way to cannabis being a, can be a psychedelic, a psychoactive food, a psychedelic food, but mushrooms all the more so, because you're literally, you're, you're eating the, the biological material or consuming it as a tea or baked or, or, or infused into other products. Um, but the idea of a psychoactive food is there's no, there's no framework for that. I mean, there's coffee, there's tea, um, I suppose, but now we're, we're talking about a psychedelic substance, a powerful long acting substance that deeply affects cognition, perception, um, uh, sense of self and so on. And I know Corinne, I know I'm pushing through the time. You give you me the are. sign, I got, I, got, <laughs> I, got, I, got, I, got, I got I got, pages of stuff to go. I know, I know, um, but you know what I loved? I loved how you brought the two parts of the title together, Noah, that was, yeah. that was brilliant. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, Noah Daly, who's on this call, put in a link to some of your writings. And folks, you really got to check out Noah's writings around this subject because it is brilliant and really insightful. Um, uh, but yeah, Noah, is there a final word that you want to say before we move on? I want to I want to slip in what was sort of like the overarching theme, and I'm not going to get to say a lot more, but I'm going to propose a paradigm for approaching this topic of, psych, of, of psilocybin in particular. Um, and I wanna come to this topic in four different, in a sense of a relationship approach and four different relationships. The species relationship between Homo sapiens and the other species on the planet, which we exploit, some of which we've driven to, um, to extinction and so on, which flows into a market or economic set of relationships um, in that another way of coming at human existence is in terms of, of markets, the exchange of goods and services, in a sense, in a complex society, agricultural society, agriculture-based society, that's, that's what we do. We're all participants in a market, um, uh, which flows into a political or legal relation, relationships between different jurisdictions, again, the, the local, state, and federal hierarchy, and the need to break controlled substances out from under the monopoly and the domination of the federal government and return it as much as possible to the local level. The second, my second to last piece on the blog is about psychedelic legalization now, and I argue that the essential point is to give as much power immediately to local governments because they can license and permit and set up safety parameters before the state can. And the task of the state should be to clear state control aside um, and they can come, the state can come along afterwards and try to reconcile the local governments. But the first thing to do in a state legislate state law should be to remove preemption, the preemption of, of what local governments can do. Um, and to give the maximum jurisdiction and to opt out of the existing state laws, coordinated as necessary to avoid a bubble in one place where there's access, there's desert, there's no access in other place. And then the last piece, which I'll hit in terms of relationships is generational. Um, you know, my heritage comes out of the yippies in a sense, uh, the Youth International Party and the part and the, the the really the agents, the champions of psychedelic and cannabis legalization from the new left. Um, and so the Youth International Party poses the young versus the old, the parents movement that came back and, and rolled back in a counter revolution, all of cannabis legalization took the other side. So one of our struggles, another way of coming at relationships in, in among homo sapiens is the generation. The young, the old, the young, the old who are looking at end of life and uh, dealing with 
a, a anxiety and terror that the youth might not have. Whereas the youth are looking at anxiety and terror, all the more so in an area of, era of climate change where the old are gonna pass on and the young are gonna be dealing with um, potentially catastrophic events. Um, the, the big action, I think we hear about veterans, veterans are to a large extent the face of psychedelic legalization in the way that the children with epilepsy became the face of cannabis. But the, po the, the action is going to be in the older population, geriatric mental health, and for good reason, because we need to, we need to change the way of looking at age and the elders um, instead of the cult of youth and the cult of beauty to turn to, um, to make peace with the wisdom. generation. The wisdom, wisdom of elders, yeah. There, there you go. So I'll pull the plug there. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll go on mute. I'm sorry I talked so long. Got a lot more to say, but I'll have to do that with, uh, offline with other folks. You know, when we were planning this symposium, we realized that two hours was never going to be enough to highlight the brilliance of the people that we came across in organizing this. Um, and speaking of brilliance, uh, what I want to do is shine the spotlight on our Brooklyn watch party. And I don't quite know how to do that. I think it's Pammy's camera um, for the tech people. If you want to highlight Pammy's camera again, um, we can see the people at the Brooklyn watch party. And maybe we can ask Colin. Oh, here he is. Colin Pugh, who's the executive director of the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society, to come on and say hello from our, our friends in Brooklyn. Hi, Colin. Hey, Corinne. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, so how, what, how was your day? How was your bicycle day? And uh, it, it was good. It wasn't the warmest day ever on Earth, uh, but we pulled through with our species relationship to the gray sky and had a nice day. Great. Yeah. How many people do you have there at your Brooklyn watch party? Um, like 30 or 40 around. Yeah. People I know. We have some pizza and kombucha. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's from, great. So I'm, I'm from what's called central New York. Uh, sometimes generally referred to upstate New York by New York Cityers, But yeah, Syracuse, uh, born and raised myself. So I just wanted to chime in to Pat up in Buffalo. <laughs> Hello. Um, well, tell us a little bit about the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society. I, I know we, we definitely want to get to uh, Luke Grandis from Vocal New York, but I want to hear, I think folks should hear what your goals are at the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society. Sure. I um, joined the Brooklyn Psychedelic Society in 2015 as a member. I lost a friend to suicide in 2014 at a very powerful healing experience from MDMA. And I wanted my, I wondered if my friend who took his own life would have had a similar, uh, you know, healing experience that I had if he would have had a similar fate or a different fate. So I joined Brooklyn Psychedelic Society as a member to kind of better understand my experience in 2015. And I've been organizing with it for seven years. And in the past two years, I've realize that we need a kind of different model and approach to these medicines that I don't think the healthcare system can currently provide um, in the most robust way. So our mission at Brooklyn Psychedelic Society is to make psychedelic healing a publicly accessible good, much like libraries do for books, by creating a nationwide network of psychedelic co-ops. Now, co-ops are democratically governed, community governed healing centers that I think can be a very viable complementary alternative to the medical model for delivering psychedelic therapy. Wow, that is a big idea. It's very exciting. And you know where people can learn more about that? Uh, you and I did a radio interview. And if somebody could find the link to that and put it in the chat, you can hear a lot more about Colin's idea of making psychedelics uh, more, more accessible. I think there's been a lot of discussion about that in the chat box, Colin. I'm sure you've been yeah. seeing that, that, you know, restricting it to a medical model or, you know, having it be something yeah. that only elites can access is not what this group is after. Yeah. Well, one thing I'd like to share is that we're at a very unique window in history where this paradigm shifting medicine, psychedelics, is already in the public domain. You can't actually patent psychedelics. And people are suffering and the healthcare system isn't exactly the Cadillac of compassion. So these three 
facts combined, I think there's a real opportunity here to build a community run network of healing centers that can give people access to these regardless of their ability to pay. So part of our mission at Brooklyn Psychedelic Society is to test out this cooperative governance model and community based healing model to see if this model can be replicated around the country. And um, I see the major issue with psychedelics, not so much as legalization, as many of us have eloquently put on this talk. Um, there's an overwhelming amount of science. What I see the main issue in their favor, what I see the main issue is, is one of access. Because what's happening now is a lot of psychedelics are getting patented and it's going much, much faster than psychedelic advocacy efforts. And it's what's happening metaphorically, it's like we discovered broccoli. And what's happening is we're letting uh, companies make broccoli HD, which you can eat exclusively at Whole Foods, but will keep broccoli illegal. So I don't think it is wrong that companies are forming in a traditional healthcare model or medical model. I think we need those. Some people will only be comfortable taking psychedelics in a medical approach. And I think that's great. I just think we have an opportunity to make a truly equitable, accessible model through psychedelic co-op. So that's what I'm trying to work on. That's amazing. I hope people check out your uh, the interview that we did. Um, Colin, can you say whether your organization has a, um, a website? Yeah, I just typed it in the great. chat. Well, I will. Great. Yeah. There are psychedelic societies all over the state. Some of them have sponsored this event tonight. I know we've, and I'm going to get it wrong, Avishai, but it's uh, the Psychedelic Society of Western New York and the Hudson, um, I'm going to get them all wrong. Somebody should just put our sponsors in the in the chat, but there's a bunch of them all over the place. Um, you know, I want to turn back. Hi, Avi. <laughs> um, hey, yeah, you got it right. It's psychedelic Society of Western New York. Hudson Valley Psychedelic Society, yeah. Brooklyn Psychedelic Society. There's all sorts of them. Ugh, I wish we had time to hear from all of you, but what I really want to do is turn the camera to Vocal New York, um, to Luke Grandis. You know, if you want to talk about getting something done in New York, the group that you want to talk to is Vocal New York. Those people get so much done and they know how to do it. And so Luke, I, I wonder if you could take a few moments and talk about how folks can get involved in um, all kinds of activities to move uh, drug policy forward. Yeah, thank you so much, Corinne. Uh, so good evening, everyone. My name is Luke Grandis. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them, theirs. I'm the upstate lead organizer for Vocal New York, which stands for Voices of Community Activists and Leaders. Uh, we're a statewide grassroots organization fighting to end the drug war and mass incarceration and AIDS and, and homelessness in New York State. And we do this by building the political power of people directly impacted by those issues. And so a lot of what we do is meet with our elected representatives here in New York, like uh, Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal, Assemblymember McDonald, you saw here tonight, um, and many others across from the state, as well as all of our senators, and meet with our electeds to talk about how we feel about these issues. And um, I was happy Linda Rosenthal actually mentioned two of the bills that we're fighting for in our statewide users union this year, and our users union is made up of people throughout uh, New York State from Brooklyn to Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, Albany, um, and all five boroughs in New York City. Um, our users union is made up of people who are using drugs, people who are in recovery, people who are on MAT, people who have lost family members and relatives to overdose um, because we believe that any fight should be led by the people being impacted by that issue, right? So. Um, the same way that a lot of the activists here tonight fighting for the liberation of the use of uh, plant medicine and mushrooms uh, are people who are benefiting from that in their own lives and people who have seen the benefits firsthand. So um, two of those bills that we're fighting for in the UU this year are to decriminalize buprenorphine, a life-saving medication that kept me alive for the first seven years of my own recovery um, from opioids, as well as a bill to legalize overdose prevention centers statewide. Um, which is the Safer Consumption Services Act. And so these are two things we need drastically here in New York. Um, and so in addition to that, we're also working on full decrim. So that's gonna include full decriminalization of all uh, drugs in New York State. Um, and 
uh, Assembly Member Rosenthal and Assembly Member McDonald are two of the champions working with us a lot with drug policy. Um, but we really can't do any of this without the people on this call, without the people in New York State. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in the chat, uh, and as Noah confirmed, really reaching out and contacting your Assembly member and your senator is such a powerful thing. When you were hearing about different bills earlier tonight, people were wondering, so what are the chances of getting these passed? Or when is that going to happen? Or what does it look like right now? What's the holdup in the health committee? Um, right now, none of the other elected representatives are hearing anything from their community members about these issues. And if you're not speaking up extra above average, they equate that to silence, basically. So remember that when you take the time to call up your assembly member or your senator, it equates to like 25 people calling up, if not more. Um, and after you know a certain number of phone calls, which isn't even that many, um, once you put in the effort, they have to escalate the issue and discuss it during case review. Um, so it's literally as simple as looking up who your local assembly member and your senator are, contacting them saying, hi, this is my name, I'm your constituent. I believe that we need to pass this bill to decriminalize psilocybin in New York State. Here's why I think we need to do that. Thank you. And that's it. And you become like one of the most badass activists overnight in like five minutes because no one else has taken the time to do that. And that's what we honestly really, really need. Um, so I'm gonna plug my contact info in the chat. Feel free to contact me with any questions about getting involved um, in New York State, or even if you're in a different state and you wanna find out something else, or if you have any harm reduction questions, that's also my other uh, little focus area of expertise. Um, and I also work for Next Distro. We do uh, mail-based harm reduction supplies. So I just wanted to share that. If anyone needs harm reduction supplies, go to next, nextdistro.org and I'll include that stuff in the chat, but yes. yeah, appreciate it. Gosh, I just feel we we got a masterclass in political advocacy from from Luke here, like a like a bonus tonight. Um, and yeah, like your Capital Region Harm Reduction Network is is not some side project. It's a really valuable community resource, and we're so lucky to have you. So awesome. Um, I we're running out of time here, uh, not unexpected, but I'm wondering. People have been posting questions in the chat, and I've been trying to toss them to the right people. Um, but I'm wondering if we could turn the camera to Collar City Mushrooms. Um, my uh, discussions with. Avery Stemple really led to this event, and I know that he's got some folks there at uh, at his mushroom farm. Um, Avery, what do you what do you think about what you heard? Uh, it's just it's fantastic to know how many passionate people there are that have been moving this process forward and are interested in continuing this dialogue and and you know really making change. And that's what I, I, we have about a dozen people here today, uh, you know, a, a person or two left. And, um, you know, I, we're, we're going to continue the dialogue here. I, I, I'm, I, I've been uh, some private chatting with some people about uh, forming some kind of maybe monthly thing where we can get together and, and see what we can do to, to help encourage people to contact their legislators and, and actually encourage change because uh, as, as Luke said, you know, it, it really is. It's, if, if people make noise, change will happen. And, and this is something that absolutely is necessary. And I'm just really happy to, to see uh, all these people that are interested in, in moving this forward. Thank you, Avery, and thanks for hosting that watch party. Avi, I feel like I cut you off. Could we, should we get you back? And do you want to plug your organization too and let folks know what you're doing up there in uh, Western New York? By all means. Um, thank you so much for hosting this incredible event. Um, just such a pleasure to hear so many people uh, really share their passion and come together. Like this is such a beautiful thing to witness. So many of the silos of the psychedelic community come together and really spread their mycelial networks and see what kind of happens from here. Um, you know, the Psychedelic Society of Western New York has been around for about six or seven years. Uh, we are very big uh, in regards to psychedelic integration. We do monthly integration circles. We have a psychedelic harm reduction project at local music festivals that we'll be recruiting volunteers for. Um, and if anybody knows the Zendo project, we are heavily inspired by them and have worked with Sarah 
and Ryan uh, to create the Sanctuary uh, Harm Reduction Project at local festivals, as well as just sharing more information about getting involved in policy efforts and education efforts um, to get better educated about what is available up here. Uh, so please find us on Facebook, uh, come to one of our events. We are starting to get the Rochester chapter um, starting to move a little bit again as well, but we're always active here in Buffalo doing psychedelic integration circles every month. And just want to have a huge shout out to Vocal New York for all the work that they've been doing. Like, thank you, Luke, and everybody at Vocal. Thank you, Corinne, for putting ever this whole thing together and everybody at the Sanctuary uh, for Independent Media. All of your work has been so essential and really ground shaking and moving for so many people in New York State. Um, so it is seen, it is heard, and it is very deeply appreciated. Um, and just wanna end with uh, much, much gratitude to everybody who's spoken today and to the assembly members who have been present today and stuck with us throughout this whole thing uh, for you know, holding the torch and keeping this dream burning. So thank you so much. And thank you to these plant medicines and these synthetic medicines that uh, you know, have catalyzed so many of our lives and so many uh, spirits across the world. Great, thank you, Avi. Any of our speakers, Hadas or Didi or Pammy, do you wanna say a final word before I turn it back over to Eileen? Thank you, Corinne, for all your work organizing this. You did a lot <laughs> and it takes a lot of work and I know you, you also had help. So thank you to everyone that supported Corinne in being a mastermind and putting this together with so much thought and intention and love. And thank you everyone for being here and for doing all of, all of the work because it really takes all of us to make this happen. It really does. Um, Dee Dee or Pammy or anyone? Sure, I could say a few last words. And I guess what I would add is that if you are in the Hudson Valley region, please contact the Hudson Valley Psychedelic Society. We're a relatively new psychedelic society and we are so interested in engaging new volunteers and people who are interested in helping decriminalization efforts, but also training volunteers to support people with psychedelic integration in our free or low cost circles and all kinds of other community events. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to get in the mix as a community member, and we would love to have you. Thank you. I guess you. if I can pop in, um, I want to yeah. backpack on Didi and the integration, 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 integration. So important. I don't want psychedelics to be separate from integration. I, that is something that needs to be spoken about more, and, and it's picking up traction more now, and there's a lot more courses where people can switch from, you know, kind of build their um, their therapies into psychedelic integration. So I just want everyone to understand the importance of integration with psychedelics. And I'll end with that. Awesome, thank you, Pammy. Eileen, do you wanna let folks know what events are coming up? And then I, I definitely wanna do a thanks to the folks behind the curtain before, uh, before people get off. But um, Eileen, do you wanna close yes, us out? Yes, we have. Uh, one event virtually on April 22nd at 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. And if you ever wonder how do bodies queer at the molecular level, how is this square inextricably tied to industrial capitalism, you can join us. It's a virtual event, 12.30 to 1.30, lunchtime. And Another one, we have actually three events on May 7th. If you're in Troy, join us for a plant swap on um, May 7th, 12 to 2 p.m. And then you have the opportunity to join for a Be The Media process. So you'll be able to talk to uh, the filmmakers of a film called Out of the Mock. And you're going to be able to ask the documentary process, how they come with the idea, how they put the camera in certain angle, how they follow the trajectory of the film. And five to six 
and then you can join after you go eat and relax and then seven to nine you actually can see the film screening and you have more questions to ask for um, the uh, producers of the film and i'm going to put the link in the chat so you are able to uh, join in register you have time for those events and i wanted to say also that um, you can hear all the radio stories from all the speakers that come sponsors of the mushroom symposium event with the co-organizers Corinne Carey and Avery's Temple of Color City Mushrooms, Pammy Jackson of Psychedelic Sisterhood, Psychedelic Policy Consultant Noah Porter, Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal, Dennis Kitchen of Lens, Jesse Gold of Heroic Hearts Project, Colin Pot of Brooklyn Psychedelic Society, Avishai Affect of Psychedelic Society of Western New York, Luke Grandes of Vocal New York, and Capital District Harm Reduction round table and I think Sina posted on the chat where you can see all that information on all these speakers and I want to say huge thanks to the folks behind the curtain that we don't see it but they put this together with us it's Steve Pierce, Brenda Miller, Emily Kuro and Sina Vasilehiki and please remember that the sanctuary exists because of the support of people like you. We are a nonprofit organization. Our name is Media Alliance. And if you have um, any donations today, I'm gonna put the, the link in the chat room if you want to help us continue our work. Um, become a sustainer. I also uh, put the link in there and if you want to become a radio producer, you have all the information there. I am grateful that Corinne uh, asked me to co-host with her. It has been a pleasure. And thank you because this happened because of you, Corinne. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of you to share your wisdom. Well, I want to close us out by... Uh... I want to take us back to a comment that was made in the chat many, 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 many pages ago, um, where someone said, don't talk about recreation. Um, and I just wanted to share something that someone mentioned to me over the weekend. I was promoting this event, as I have been for the past uh, several months, actually, and I was telling them about this and, and about, you know, the differences in the community about um, therapeutic use and recreational use and, um, and med medicinal use. And the person said, what's the point of recreation if not to restore, renew, maintain, spark, cure health? So what really is the difference? between those three. And I, at that, I just, I thought that was a really interesting notion and I'm gonna carry that forward as I think about advocacy around this issue and, and how we talk about the difference between, um, you know, these three different kinds of uses, uses of psychedelics because maybe they're not so different after all. And just like a walk in the park, as someone said during one of my radio interviews can restore health and mental health, so too can these plants. Um, so I am so grateful to all of you for joining us tonight. I'm grateful to our speakers who were just brilliant, Didi and Hadass and Pammy and Noah um, uh, um, and, and the assembly members. Um, Linda Rosenthal is a true pioneer. You know, she champions issues that people think are just, you know, not possible and then they become possible. And unfortunately, sometimes they become possible after many, many people are harmed. Um, so people should listen to Ro Linda Rosenthal. That's what I think. Um, anyway, thank you all. It is nine o'clock. I promised that we'd end, uh, you know, end on time. I wanna be a good steward of your, of your evening. So I hope the folks in Brooklyn continue to enjoy each other's company, uh, the folks in Troy as well, and um, more to come, right? I mean, there's so much more to talk about here. So I hope we'll see you in one format or another in the future. And I really thank everyone for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone.